Welcome to Investor's Coffee Shop. We're your host, Brian Hart. Adam el -Tarhuni. I have been working in the financial industry for over 18 years. I started in New York City and in 2010, expanded my business to Alexandria, Virginia. For over 25 years, I've been gaming and investing in collectibles. I grew up in Georgia and in 2017, moved to Washington, D.C. Investor's Coffee Shop is for people who want to learn more about investing, make better decisions, create new streams of income. In each episode, we will discuss investing in art, wine, collectibles, stocks, bonds, real estate, and anything else that may generate a profit. Join us at Investor's Coffee Shop. And we're back for part three of our trust series. And last week, we discussed the different types of revocable trust. And this week, we'll be focusing on the different types of irrevocable trust and the different components that are within them. Adam, since the last time we spoke, I know you're a big fan of Dragon Con. And a lot of people may not know what Dragon Con is, but it's a big convention in Georgia where they have different types of people who dress up as different characters, Magic the Gathering, Pokemon cards. And I was thinking as an investor, going down to these events, what are your favorite things to pick up? That Dragon Con is, it's actually in... U.S. the biggest general fantasy convention, and it's the second biggest convention after San Diego Comic Con. You have a vendor hall with at least four floors of different vendors from all over the world, bringing different items that you can purchase and collectibles. But they also have an artist alley where people, such as people like Chris Claremont, person who eventually saved the X Men, they're signing autographs, selling collectibles as well, and all different kind of famous, not just artists, but people throughout kind of the fan history. They're selling unique works of art. There's a lot to choose from. I never go into the deep part of it. There's a, you know, there's a section that you can do an auction. And then at the end of Dragon Con, they do kind of a silent auction where people can pick up unique pieces and things like that. It's usually out of my price range. I'm there just to have fun and meet other people. A lot of opportunity to pick up unique items. Have you ever once bought something and surprisingly the value went up quite a bit? Picked up a lot of Magic Card. There are a lot of Magic Card vendors. And if you've listened to previous episodes, I invest in Magic the Gathering cards. So I have picked up a lot of things where a vendor has priced them low. They didn't know how prices have changed over even the past month or so. And then you can just kind of get a really good deal that you can later hold on to or sell for immediate profit. Before getting into trust accounts with Chris, I would like to go over a few things that's been happening in and around the world. As we know, Silver Bank has gone under and a lot of other financial institutions have been going under as far as the banking causing people to panic. Now, with that, it shows how important it is to have your funds not just in one location, but in multiple locations. And not just for that reason alone. This happened to me last week. My wife went to the gym where she works out every morning from 530 to about 6 30 7 o'clock in the morning and as she got out of her car she was meeting up with her friends and before she even got in the building someone had broken into our vehicles smashed the windows and took her purse and ran even though her door was unlocked they could have just politely opened the door and taken the bag and left but they decided to break our window we had to cancel the credit cards we did everything that you can normally do contacted the bank and somehow two days later they drained our bank accounts Luckily, I do have separate other bank accounts, so we're able to pay our bills and we're able to live our life as normal, but this is a huge thing that came to my mind, like what if we did have everything at Wells Fargo? We wouldn't have access to anything. So my recommendation for people, not just because of the run on the banks, but you should have assets in a few different locations in case anything happens that you cannot plan for. So going back to Chris Hanks to finalize our part three of this series, Chris, welcome back. Thanks for having me again, guys. Yeah, and Chris, so we've learned a lot about trust. We're going to learn a lot more. But one key question we have is, how does one choose the right trust attorney? That's a good question. And really what it comes down to, like with any attorney or even CPA or especially financial advisor, just comes down to someone that you trust. And someone that you are certain has your best interest at heart. Now, there's always going to be a cost involved. You want to make sure the person isn't fresh out of law school. But still, more, more, even more important than any of that, you want to make sure that they, you trust them, they care about you, and that they are, are able and willing to do exactly what you need them to do. Say I move to a new state and I have to find an attorney there. Is there a network? Say I know you and I move to Montana. 
Do you have people you could refer that you trust that I could work with? Or is there another way for people to kind of find, if they're new to an area, a trustworthy trust attorney? Yeah, me personally, I am part of a Virginia network of elder law attorneys and trust attorneys. And then that is part of a sort of a national network. And so generally in those instances, what I do is I email the Virginia attorneys and I say, does anybody here, has anybody here worked with a Montana attorney or a California attorney that they liked? Uh, and then I get a couple of names and that's the good starting place to go. If you don't have anybody, I would then contact the state bar in that state and tell them exactly what you're looking for. They can be the perfect referral service for you. And then finally, I find a trust attorney. What should I or anyone else bring to the first appointment? This is a simple premise, but is the best way to get exactly what you want. So I always tell clients before we come, I don't need to know about bank accounts or houses or assets. We'll get to all that if we move forward. What I need you to do is come up with if the best possible scenario for if the worst happens. If you are a family and you're worried about your kids, so if you and your wife are going away on a plane and the plane crashes and you both pass, what's the best possible thing? Don't worry about legality. Don't worry about plausibility. Don't worry about any of it. Just absolutely your dream scenario. Have that mapped out. And then the, the good attorney will work backwards from there on how, okay, this is, this is perfect. So how do we accomplish this through, you know, careful drafting or finding, you know, someone to, to fill in the different roles. Uh, but having that at your first meeting will do more to flesh out exactly what you need and how that attorney can help you than anything else. And someone does a business plan or a product plan and they you start with the end and you'll work your way to get there. So that's wonderful. Exactly. Excellent. Now getting into irrevocable living trust, What is the main difference between this one and the revocable trust? Irrevocable trusts are locked boxes. So you you build the box. You are part of the drafting. You are part of the instructions of the trustee. But once you put property or anything into that trust, you then lose any legal right to get it back. Not to say it can never come back to you, but you have no method to go to a court. You can't say to go to a court and say, hey, I I want this property back. I want this money back. I don't like the decisions that are being made. That's gone. Now, as I've said before in these, and when we've talked about trust, the, the key to this is, is careful drafting. You have to have in the trust. So once you do that, once you lock the box, the t- person that is the trustee then has to use that trust document as their instructions for how to spend the money. And anything they do that doesn't comply with those instructions, that is when you can then go to a court and say, this person needs to be removed or something has gone wrong. So you put it, when you're drafting it, you're saying, This is only to be used for my benefit, things that benefit me uh, other than your fees or benefit my family, my wife, my kids, my brother, you know, however you want to do it. It's got to take care of my dog. It's my, it's my intention. I'm going to put this house into here, but it's my intention that we keep it for 20 years or 50 years or that it not be sold or that it be rented out. You, you know, you can build the box, but once it's closed and once property is in there, it's gone. Now this can be good. For Medicaid, like we talked about last week, the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, that's a a type of irrevocable trust. And making it irrevocable removes it from your estate after five years. It also can work for creditor protection. In Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia, that is what is known as a qualified self-settled spendthrift trust, uh, which is a big old mouthful. But what what it says is if you comply with these certain regulations, mostly being that the trustee that you choose does not work for you and is not related to you, if you do that and you have spendthrift provisions in there where the person who's the beneficiary cannot compel a distribution, and I think you have to wait, I want to say five years, it might be five or it might be seven. If you comply with those, then that, you know, the money that is in there cannot be touched by your creditors. You default on a bond, you get sued for a crazy amount of money. Your creditors cannot touch that money at all, and it will only be used for your benefit. Uh, so again, it's the same, like the trust will then pay all the property on the pay all the property taxes on the house that you have it will do for maintenance it can do you know as long as there's sufficient capital in there it it can do everything you can keep that house nobody can touch it and the instructions of the instructions say I don't want it to be sold then it's never sold now you do need to be with an irrevocable trust keep in mind what you exactly what you want to use it for going back to my earlier point if it's medicaid if you're concerned about medicaid well in the commonwealth of virginia your primary home is not part of your medicaid estate so you don't gain anything by putting it into a revocable trust. But if you have a vacation home somewhere on the beach, you can get a lot of putting it into an irrevocable trust. These are uh, less used because most people, very rightfully so, are very nervous about giving away these things that they have. 
and losing any legal right to do it because there is a scenario where you can do it and the trustee then sells everything. Now, if the trust has been drafted correctly, they need to use the money that they have there then for your benefit. They can't use it and, you know, run to Mexico, but you give up, you know, you don't want that house sold, but the trustee does, the trustee wins. So the trustee ends up with all the power, essentially. And so if I put my comic book collection into this trust, he then, even if I wrote down, I don't want it sold, he has the right to sell it? Not necessarily. Not if you've written down, you don't want it sold, or you've placed in the document itself some restrictions on when, it, when and how it can be sold. Then the person doesn't, because they have to use that trust document as the sort of, that is the, the, what they're guided on. So if they do it in, in countervailing, you know, and against that document, you then have the legal right to go to a court and say, this trustee's breached their, their duty. They failed to comply with the trust document. We need a new trustee in there. And hopefully you can sort of undo any of the transactions that they did. Okay. So this is mainly for people who do not want to manage this themselves when it comes down to it. This is a big, big thing here. Absolutely. I've seen it used a lot with uh, children that, you know, older children, you know, 18, 19, but who are going, the parents want to give them a house or something like that, but they're very worried about the, how this kid is going to spend the money. You know that once you do it in this irrevocable trust, the kid can live there. The kid can live there in perpetuity. The trust will take care of everything, but the kid can't sell this house and use the money for, to go to a bunch of music festivals. Like you're worried that they're going to. I also see it a lot with uh, elderly uh, you know, people taking care of their parents, they'll buy a house, but put it into the irrevocable trust so that the parent can live there uh, for their benefit and, but doesn't have the right to sell it. And then the kid doesn't have to deal with any of that day to day, the dishwasher broke, any of that, that's not on them. All right. And then what type of person should stay away from this type of account then, this type of trust? There can be. And if, if you're using it for Medicaid protection, that can cause some problems. But if it's just, I want you know, this house to be, I want this vacation home to not be a part of my creditor thing. It does. And then you can have a date on it, but that will also end the creditor protection. How does this affect your net worth? Because once you put it in there, you no longer own it. So you can't claim a value that you have. That you're gaining. I would say most people, if you, unless you're a very high net worth individual, or you think that uh, you're going to be sued at some point, you know, but again, even if you think you're going to be sued at some point, you've got to give it at least five years for the qualified self swelled spendthrift trust in order to get any of the protection. I would say 97% of people probably don't really have the need for an irrevocable trust. Uh, but if you're a high net worth individual, you can get a lot of uh, stuff. So one of them is called uh, a Cupert, Qualified Personal Residence Trust. It is, this is a trust that can be very useful to a very, very, very small percentage of people. Because again, if you're worried about Medicaid, your, your personal residence in the Commonwealth of Virginia is not counted towards Medicaid purposes. This trust can only hold your personal residence in it. But if you want to avoid, if you have a large enough estate that you, your house itself is going to subject you to the estate tax, you can use a Cupert to avoid that. You can do it if, again, giving this, this house to somebody when you pass is going to subject into the gift tax, even if you know, you, you've already used up your $12 million lifetime gift tax exclusion, then this is a very good way to do it. It's a very, very narrow audience of people. But for that narrow audience of people, it's very useful because you put your personal residence into this trust, you have the benefit of it, you can live there. And once you pass, everything passes and you avoid estate tax, gift tax, uh, things like that. But once you put it in there, you, you don't have a legal right to get it out. So if you put your art or you put your stock accounts and everything else into this type of trust and it's no longer yours, you technically can't get a loan against those items, correct? Technically not. Although again, you know, it would vary bank by bank by what they're happy with as collateral, but that could be addressed in the drafting of the document, allowing you to take a loan against, take a personal loan from the trust. If the trust is big enough that you can get a loan at a stated interest rate at any time. Uh, from the trust. That is, uh, use, there are some rich people who kind of, that's how they, there's a large family trust, millions and millions and millions of dollars. Their income that they're getting, every, that the recipients that they're getting are getting at a 0% loan. So then technically it's not really income to them because it's a loan. You know, there's ways to massage it through there. So again, you can do that from careful drafting, but again, you know, it's going to vary bank by bank what they're comfortable with and the size of the collateral. If a person gets sued, they have no connections to this account. No. It is, it's interesting because in this kind of, you know, once assuming that you 
fulfill all the boxes. And this is a qualified self settled spendthrift trust. And there's a million dollars in there. I like cartoonishly large numbers. A creditor can't touch anything within that trust until I make a distribution to that person. So I give you $10,000 a month. As soon as that $10,000 hits your bank account, it becomes yours and the creditor can go after that is how they do it. But you can get around that so by the large trust. The large trust owns the house that you live in. The large trust pays your utilities every month. It's, it's all of that done. So it never really hits your bank account as something that a creditor can attach to. Does the trust in itself have its own bank account? Yes, absolutely. Irrevocable trust. That's a very good point. Irrevocable trusts have their own EIN. An irrevoc- or, I'm sorry, an irrevocable trust has its own EIN. It files its own tax return. Uh, it, it Generally, if, if you're making a lot of income into your trust, it's taxed at a much higher rate than a personal income tax. But an irrevocable tr- or an a revocable trust does not have its own EIN because, again, it's like the LLC of trusts that is just attributed to you. Any income that the trust makes is just your income. You report it on your tax forms as income to you, and that's how you pay it. All right. And a testamentary trust, what is that? Testamentary trusts are, I call them just in case trusts. Testamentary trusts, like they sound, are started, are, are drafted in wills. And each one of my wills that I draft has a section in it that says, when I pass, if anybody who is a beneficiary of this trust is receiving medical benefits or is, you know, you could, I've seen stuff where it's, if I, if the trustee or the, pardon me, the executor of the will thinks that the, one of the beneficiaries has a drug problem as evidenced by X, Y, and Z, you know, there's a clear layout, then the money is to be held in trust with these guidelines. But if the person isn't receiving government benefits, doesn't have a drug problem, is just a normal person, then the trust can't be created. It's only, it's just, it's like a just in case trust. Make sure I understand this. I want to set it up for my future kids. I don't know where they'll be in that life. So if I think they'll have drug problems or they'll have anything, you set this up. I mean, how do you know what those problems are going to be in the future? Yeah, you don't. That's the hard part. That's why it's also, it's, it's, you have to have very specific for a testamentary trust, a very specific set of things that need to happen for the trust to be created. That it's not just if, if the executor thinks they're on drugs, if the executor thinks they're on drugs as evidenced by this, cri- this set of criteria. So if the person, cause you know, I can go into, I can have one. If I'm the beneficiary, the trustee just says, or the executor just says, you're on drugs. I can go to a court and say, I'm not, they need to give me this money. And then the court will look at that set of criteria as spelled out in the trust. So it is, it is a trust that you set up just in case and can only come into play if a specific set of circumstances. So it, you mentioned kind of on maybe medical issues. So if you maybe a case would be you have a history of diabetes in your family, you think your children might need insulin, you can add that as a qualifier for some type of trust like this? You could. It's much more common to set it up to say if the per, if one of the beneficiaries of this will or one of the is receiving Medicaid at the time I pass, then I want you to start a special needs trust with their share. Their share should go into a special needs trust so they can keep those government benefits but still get gain the benefit of this. Yeah. Okay. And then we know about a miners trust. What is that? Miners trust is probably it's a type of testamentary trust. It's probably the most used type of testamentary trust. So miners trust is you have small children and you pass and what you do is you direct you and your wife both pass you and your spouse both pass is a better way to put it you direct all of your your home to be sold all of your bank accounts to be liquidated and all of your life insurance to flow into this miners trust and that is trust that is to be used for your children while they are minors the the, the reason that it's better to do that is the guardianship so under a trust you have an, a duty to an account Every dollar that's spent that's not on the sort of trustees' fees has to has to be there has to be a direct line back to your children's benefit, and you can also place in there that I want them to. The way I like to do it is not that they get a distribution when they're eighteen years old or when they're twenty five years old or however you do is that they become the trustee of this trust when they become when they hit a certain age, which gives them the ability to if they if this is a very large trust and it's very well diversified and it's producing income to them. It gives them the ability to keep the way the keep things the way they are, keep those investments in place, uh, or to make different decisions if they want to. But I think that gives them a little bit more flexibility than just when they hit twenty five, cash out everything, give them a big check. So it keeps it in that EIN category yes. of trust, yes. and since they're the trustee, then they can technically close it out too. Correct. They could if they wanted to, or they could keep it open. It leaves it leaves that option for them. 
And if you're going to do that, I would, I would recommend saying they get it at 25. Nobody wants to be an 18 year old with a lot of money and a trust. That's yeah. not going to work out well. I do the same thing with clients. I generally recommend keeping it between 21, 25, just because I know what I was like in college. And I think we all have our stories. Exactly. And then going into the miners account, just to make sure I understand it correctly. So obviously the trust will cover the miners account into the age that you agree upon, whether it's 18 to 25, whatever it may be in advance. Once the miner inherits the trust, is there anything in play that keeps them from frivolously spending it or it's theirs? They can do what they want. There really is nothing you can do at that point. You could write it in, but generally when I do it, it's they can do whatever they want with it. They have trust. They're, they're then in the position of being the beneficiaries and the trustees of the trust. So they have to spend every dollar that out of it for their own benefit. But since the only people now in this trust are, you have the beneficiaries and the trustees, since they're the same person, that person's not going to sue themselves demand an accounting from themselves. Uh, they are generally, if they're, if they're a 25, I think you, you, I think it, it, for me personally at 25, if I had a large trust, I probably would have kept it that way at 18, not a chance at 21, probably not. So if you're going to do it that way, I would do it at 25 when you've got a little bit more seasoning underneath you. And with these types of accounts, um, it seems they're definitely geared towards more of the ultra wealthy or wealthy individuals. Are any of these type of accounts more for the average person now, the average person would benefit the most from a revocable trust because it gives them the protection of a trust, the estate planning, the forward thinking planning, but it still allows them to make any changes that they want at any time for any reason. And they don't have to get another EIN. They don't need to file another bank or another you know, IRS tax filing. Uh, it's much easier. To separate the differences between revocable and revocable per income, would you say if you have a million dollars more, you should do this one? Or is there a number that separates the two? Uh, the only number that separates the two, it would be, a hard line would be the estate tax. And if you're coming up on the lifetime gift tax exclusion, which I think is 12.2 million for the gift tax. Uh, if, you, if those numbers are numbers that concern you, then you should really start thinking about irrevocable trusts. Uh, if they're not like me, I'm not, I'm not concerned about those numbers in any way. I will probably, I personally have a revocable trust uh, that just has very explicit instructions of what happens if I pass, what happens if my wife and I pass, et cetera. Excellent. And uh, Adam, do you have any more questions for Chris? No, I think that covers everything I ever wanted to know about trust. Are there any other different types of these trusts that we should know about? Not that you should know about. There are a myriad of examples of, of different trusts, especially if you go to the very high end stuff, very boutique trusts that can do There's South Dakota trust. There's all over the place. Uh, just find a good trust attorney. Again, go in with your absolute dream scenario um, and then front work backwards from there. And that is the best way you're going to get what you need. But there's nobody who can't benefit from a trust. Excellent. Well, I'd like to thank Chris for doing this three-part series on trust accounts with us today. And again, what's the best way for people to reach out to you? Go to my website, www.hankslaw.org. That's O-R-G. My personal cell phone number and my email address are both on there. Call me anytime. And if you have any questions that we didn't get to, please list them in the comments section below, or you can email us at investorscoffeeshop at gmail.com. You can also reach us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, hit subscribe, like, and leave us a review. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. We will see you next time at Investors Coffee Shop.